Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I will tell you some new amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Boss lost about a thousand dollars because he wanted to cut costs and didn't listen to me. The Situation as a new property maintenance supervisor, the riding lawnmower we have frequently breaks down. Several of these issues are the result of years of neglecting preventative maintenance, which I've now started conducting to improve the machine's performance, extend its useful life, and reduce downtime and mechanics charges. I've been researching this mower for practically all of my free time so that I know what's wrong when something goes wrong and be able to predict whether a repair will take 30 minutes and cost $40 or three days and cost $600. I was beginning a maintenance diary on the lawnmower a few weeks back when my supervisor came into the room and asked, has that thing broken down again? No, I'm just making sure that it doesn't break down again, I respond. This is when he informs me that our, our main expense is labor and that he believes what I'm doing is a waste of time and money. He now wants me to take the mower to the mechanic across the city whose labor costs $110 per hour rather than me continuing to work on it myself. Naturally, the mower malfunctions once more the next week. Once I inform my supervisor that I believe the air filter is most likely the cause of the issue, he simply advises me to take it to a mechanic. My entire team and I now have to drive across the city for 45 minutes to drop off the mower to the mechanic, and surely enough, all they had to do was repair the air filter, which took them all day. They also claimed to have thoroughly examined the situation and discovered no additional problems before charging us a few hundred dollars. The mower started having problems again two days later after I received it back from the repair. The fuel filter looked quite dusty, but I knew it wasn't the air filter. After telling my boss about it a second time, he advised me to take it back to a mechanic. Back we go, and I discussed my problems to the mechanics and mentioned that the gasoline filter appears to be damaged. They replace the fuel pump module after determining that that is likely the cause and leave the fuel filters alone. They then charge us for an additional three hours of labor plus components, and the issue is still not resolved. When we return the mower to them, it malfunctions on someone's front yard once more. When I phone the mechanic, he appears perplexed and tells us to bring it back so they can continue working on it. They keep it for three days this time. I informed them that the fuel filter was malfunctioning, but they insisted that the fuel pump was the culprit and disassembled the entire fuel system before they finally agreed with me. In essence, it cost us nearly a full week of lost work and more than $1,000 in mechanics fees since my employer insisted that every time there's a problem with the riding mower that we take it to the technician even if I can fix it myself. I could have had it fixed in two hours and for less than $100. Since then, he's asked me to purchase a supply of spark plugs, fuel filters, and air filters so I can easily replace them on my own. He also asked me to service the engine on another riding lawnmower we have in order to get it running again. For major issues, I still rely on the mechanic more than on myself, but perhaps most of those can be avoided by performing routine maintenance. I guess he must have thought that taking it to a mechanic was the cutting edge solution or something, but that turned out to be quite the disaster. You tried to weed out the issues yourself, but he just wouldn't let you seed it through. Instead, he fertilized the mechanics business, and you ended up getting mowed down by the cost. Maybe you could start a new business venture and offer a motivation service where you teach bosses how to avoid cutting corners and make sure their equipment is well maintained. It's always better to hedge your bets and save money in the long run, rather than letting things spiral out of control. So let's raise a glass of lemonade to you, the unsung hero of lawn maintenance, and may your grass always be green, and your mowers always in top condition. The second story is, Deli worker dealt with abusive management and crybaby customers who demanded the impossible. They only ended up losing out on a lot more cheese. Unaware individual, much to their dismay, Chuck, not their real name, is an upchuck, was hired by the Walmart Deli. Chumps in management mistreat individuals who work there every day for their own personal gain. Crybaby customers are crybabies. Clients who are kind enough everywhere in the store always act rudely with the deli staff. They're full of nonsense, so that would probably explain it, but it's still always a mystery. Upchuck was over doing deli stuff. They detested being deli employees. They would be crying while working in the Walmart deli because they were so depressed. 
Every day, there is misery. The chumps refused to transfer Upchuck because they did a nice and careful job at the deli. Upchuck did a reasonably decent job of estimating how much to cut in order to achieve the weight at the desired thickness for the abusive crybabies, but he wasn't quite accurate because different objects weigh quite differently. Crybaby then arrives and requests one pound or 454 grams of cheese that has been chopped to medium thickness, a completely useless, meaningless description like the word bagish. Upchuck asks if it's okay to cut a slice, and it is. Upchuck slices a handful and places it on the piece of paper before weighing it. Upchuck had accidentally cut way too much, about half a pound too much, but realized they would have to throw it away because they couldn't sell it to anyone else. So they added one last piece, which brought the weight over by 0.06 pounds, about 27 grams, which is acceptable to most customers. They then printed out a cost label, added the remaining excess they had unintentionally cut, and placed everything in the bag with price label before giving it to the crybaby. Crybaby received more without having to pay more, and Upchuck didn't have to discard any. Everyone is content. Or so Upchuck believed. Upchuck continues to wait on additional crybabies while continuing to snap and scream uncontrollably at them. The original crybaby then returns, upset because Upchuck gave them 1.06 pounds instead of 1. Clearly, attempting to take advantage of the clients to increase revenue for the Malwart Deli, Crybaby insisted that there would be just what Crybaby requested for, one pound and no more. No, Upchuck couldn't care less about making the Malwart Deli any additional money or not. The deli throws away food all day, every day. That's where they lose money. Fine. Wonderful. Nobody gets off easily doing well. Really good. Absolutely perfect. Hence, Upchuck takes everything out of the bag, takes out roughly a third of it, and adds it back up to just about or under one pound. He then displays this, adds a piece, and when it's over, he takes it off. Throws the extra on the tray next to the slicer as a waste after adding it to the large pile they still have in their hands and printing a new label. Crybaby begins to object, saying they wanted the full amount over one pound removed, not just a third of it. Upchuck demonstrates that it is currently barely at or below one pound. Much more would have caused it to go over. He then says that they sliced it too much and chose to give it to the crybaby rather than toss it away. He put it right back on, right away, crybaby advises. No, they can't. It's already been thrown away, explains Upchuck. According to crybaby, they can see it on the tray. According to Upchuck, it is now tainted and cannot be sold to anyone anymore. Crybaby demands that more is cut and that it be given to them for free. Nothing is sold to anyone if it is not put on the paper. Not only in this situation, it's a food safety concern. Upchuck claims that they have more to cut, but they just can't give it to Crybaby because doing so would require charging for it and increasing the deli's expenses. Crybaby realizes that they made a mistake after throwing a fit about 0.06 pounds or 27 grams of cheese and cheating oneself out of roughly half a pound or 227 grams of free cheese since they couldn't think of any decent reasons why they should be given any. Evil compliance was attained. Edit. When it comes to what they do with the deli, it appears like folks go completely insane. And when someone asks for a pound of beef to be shaved, almost no one agrees on what that term entails, especially considering that most items in a deli cannot be chopped that way. The challenge is that the slicer operator must make an educated guess because there are no settings on the slicers that match the numbers on the sign. Many still desire something that is thinner than the one on the sign, but they personally refer to as shaved, but this is not achievable with actual meat. Instead, only meat product, which is similar to thick meat jello and is held together only by thickeners. Now that's a cheesy situation if I've ever heard one. It sounds like crybabies got a little too whiny for their own good, and now they're out of a bunch of free cheese. Never mess with someone who works at the deli. Those slicers are sharp, and so are their employees' tongues. Let's hope Upchuck gets out of that Malwart deli soon, though. Let this be a lesson to all the crybabies out there. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, or you might end up biting off more than you can chew. The next story is, Karen mistook my pool for a road. For this story, let's call my neighbor Karen. I know, it's corny, but it describes her as a person as accurately as possible. Her favorite hobby is to cause problems for everyone who lives close to her. She's been my neighbor for decades, so over the years, I've learned to balance my relationship with her so that I don't have too many surprises coming my way. This lady was a strange person, to put it mildly, who could just walk onto someone's private property and act as she had lived on this land all of her life. 
No one was very offended by her when this happened because we all realized that she was definitely not okay. So we tried to build the best possible relationship with her. And our relationship culminated in one summer evening when she took the keys to her son's classic car out of his pocket and drove it, I'm not afraid to say expensive, car into my private pool. It felt very surreal because I had never seen a car sticking out of a pool before and I had never seen a car sticking out of my private pool. Now, it's funny to write and recall, but at the moment, I was not laughing. I was helping this Karen get out of the car and out of the pool and as soon as she got out, she said it was 100% my fault because I chose such an unpredictable place for the pool. Like, what? A few days later, Karen sued me for damaging her family car, which she and her husband had been saving for for so long to please their son. The funny thing is that the local housing association supported her. I, by the way, only found out at that moment that we had a chairman of the HOA. I've never had any contact with the HOA in like 10 years, although I am officially a member of the HOA. It was so funny to see how the HOA and its boss thought that if they said that I was to blame for Karen drowning her car, then I would just immediately listen to their analysis and take their speculation as the truth. I had a little surprise for Karen which was that I had CCTV footage that clearly showed her driving the car. The police who arrived at the scene of the incident took my side without question. The real action took place in the courtroom. It turned out that this incident was not the first in which Karen was involved, so the court quite easily ruled in my favor. The total amount of damages paid to me by my neighbor and her family is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because, well, my pool was destroyed, as well as most of my private property near the pool. By the way, I don't know where the car went, because it was towed away in an unknown direction immediately after the incident, but I never saw it again. Do you have any idea where it could have gone? Perhaps they sold it somehow through like a impound lot or something? The last story is, company uses illegal things, so I quit and started my own company. A little background, I'm a teacher with a degree in advertising and have worked in information technology for the past 20 years or so. However, I only recently realized how much I enjoy teaching. In the interim, I attended numerous schools from the largest to the smallest, and gain a ton of expertise in the classroom and behind the scenes, creating workbooks, video courses, learning platforms, and other things. I, therefore, began to believe that it was past time for me to transition to a management job. The chance came at a prominent school of digital art, and I was hired as its teaching manager, in charge of supervising all the instructors and the interns' academic schedules. For a while, it was a challenging but honest profession. It soon became clear that my supervisor was not exactly who he had intended to portray to the students and staff. As he became angry, he would alienate the group by demanding impractical outcomes and requesting information about tasks he had never given them, but somehow was our job to guess. He once took a hold of a large chair during a conference and pretended to toss it across the room. He thought it was a joke. Nobody even flinched because no one had any doubts about his ability to carry out the deed. Naturally, no one else laughed either. You have no job security for 90 days in my nation because employers are allowed to hold employee contracts for up to three months. This means that you could be fired at any time with no repercussions to the business. This my supervisor constantly reminded everyone of, half-jokingly, in an effort to keep everyone on their toes. In fact, he excused me from this treatment. He had a bad habit of treating managers differently and continued to praise my work up until the day my temporary contract expired, at which point I became an actual employee with full benefits and was protected from being fired without being paid, everything the law required. 
So it truly caught me off guard when he began his aggressive behavior less than a day after our temporary employment finished and my full employment started. The compliments were gone, replaced with screaming, negative feedback, and increasingly irrational demands. Every week, we paid a third-party vendor to maintain the classroom computers, but for some reason, errors and crashes were suddenly my responsibility. He once forbade me from leaving until I had all the computers operating properly, forcing me to stay on a Saturday after school had ended and after all the kids and staff had left. He requested me to help him locate a new seller, so I suggested a friend, making it clear that I was in no way asking for him to be recruited. Rather, I was simply making introductions. If the seller liked the buddy after speaking with him, it was his choice and responsibility whether or not to hire him. A few weeks later, he chastised me for having drinks with this friend of mine, claiming that managers should only interact with other managers and that I should not mix with the staff because they were beneath us, apparently. I told him that was ridiculous and reminded him that I had known this man for a long time and that he was welcome to join us for drinks at any moment. He did not anticipate that response. The abuse went on and even got worse. One day, my left arm came completely numb and I started having chest aches. I went back to my friend's office where his fiance was at the time and gently explained to her, when you phoned for an ambulance, I went back to my boss's office. Please excuse me, I'll lay down here for a few minutes because I believe I might be having a heart attack so the pupils can't see me here. Naturally, she lost her mind after this. The good news is that it was just an anxiety attack and that it wasn't the first one. It was the first time I had seen my mother weep since my father passed away more than 20 years earlier, when I was 36 years old, from, of course, a heart attack. I gave my 30 days notice after deciding that enough was enough and cited my health problems. I still hadn't worked there for six months, and the stress was still causing me to worry about starting a baby too soon, so I got down with my boss and explained the situation. I gave him all the assurances that he needed that I would continue working through my whole notice period to finish every project we had started since my hire. So I completed the course updates, the creation of our brand new e-learning platform, the recruiting of the teachers for the upcoming semester, and even the filming of films to advertise each and every course offered by the school. I don't know the English title for it, but it's the path that the company has planned for the growth of each position. He called me in his office with less than a week until my last day to show the new career plans for the company. So, as you can see, that is what you'll be paid in a few months, if you quit being a wimp and start doing your effing job, that is. I found that pretty hard to believe. I tried to take the high road and finish things on a positive note after all the abuse and toxicity, and he referred to my health problems as being a sissy. I was finished. I instructed him to simply deduct the upcoming days from my final payment before leaving. Now for the retaliation. Do you recall how I introduced him to a friend and he ended up hiring that person? Although I was still employed, I told my boss that I would soon start my own school, but omitted to explain that this other employee was also my business partner. Our supervisor was enraged when my friend asked for his 30 days notice by himself. He practically threw my friend out, urging him to never step foot in there again and to leave right away. According to the law, he was required to pay for the entire month as well as the days he had still had to labor before, in addition to commissions. He had more than enough money to launch our new business after adding my last payment, which included six months of benefit. The retaliation is not that, though. He really forced us to sign a document like an NDA that contained numerous illegal clauses that rendered the entire contract unenforceable and forbade us from disclosing any trade secrets while we were employed by them or afterward at the danger of being fined $30,000, about $6,000 at the time. Yet no contract in the world can stop someone from reporting criminal activity, at least not in my nation. Because of this, I was unconcerned when I reported him and his school for not having more than 50 PCs running unauthorized copies of Windows, Office, the complete Adobe Suite, Revit Cinema 4D, 3DS Mask, and many other pricey programs. It would be an understatement to say that the government was treating piracy seriously at the time, given that not long before this, a significant and established chain of retailers in our state had to declare bankruptcy due to having to pay retroactive fines upon Windows alone. It gets funny when you discover that the reported individual receives an email right away after the complaint is made, 
that contains the whole complaint, aside from the name of the reporter's author, so he can prepare his defense. It wasn't all that shocking when he answered. Uh, an identical email informing us of a 30 illegal copies of Windows and numerous other business products arrived in our mailbox around five minutes after we reported the problem. My business partner and the finance manager at our former employer still communicated, and knowing that our former boss would likely be standing next to him yelling and fuming, they decided to send him a picture of our sole classroom, where there was no computer to be found. We decided to specialize in classes about comic book making, which dispensed computers, and whenever we would host a class that demanded it, we would ask our students to bring their own. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's really funny how he starts doing everything not only to be on a sinking ship, but also take others with him. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.